will uh, record the meeting. So we'll start the recording. Uh, there is some great information today, but this is this is exciting. Our it's really only our second CEO roundtable event. Uh, when Amber and I got together and and cooked up this idea. Uh, or late last year, we launched in February with our first event in person, and then you know what happened after that. So, uh, so actually in this format, I think we're gonna have a great crowd, uh, and it is good to see so many faces today uh, that I have not seen, uh, and, and some are still new to me, so uh, I do look forward to meeting some of you, uh, whether virtually or in person again soon, but this will be a, a great opportunity to sort of reinvigorate our CEO roundtable opportunities. And it's just a chance to, to share ideas and exchange uh, information and connect with you all as industry leaders uh, on a more regular basis. Uh, and again, I think the partnership with the Tucson Metro Chamber for us, at least at the city of Tucson Office of Economic Initiatives, I didn't introduce myself, I should say I'm Barbara Coffey, a director of the Office of Economic Initiatives for the city of Tucson and, uh, and truly an honor to be here and really a pleasure to work with Amber and her team at the Tucson Metro Chamber. So again, a great dialogue. I'm going to go ahead and get us rolling and kick it over to Amber to say uh, a welcome and also to introduce our first presenter uh, this morning. We will follow our keynote presentation uh, by a panel to celebrate National Manufacturing Day. So we'll get into that uh, after our first presenter. Amber? Good morning, everyone. Like Barbara said, when we first began this program, we were really amb ambitious of wanting quarterly meetings with CEOs to really be able to discuss local issues, have some strong programming, and then of course COVID hit about three or four weeks later. Um, so really this is about you. This is about being able to get access to talk to each other, build those partnerships, get a feel of what's going on in the community. And so our first guest today is actually one of our chamber board members as well, uh, Danette Bewley. I can't say anymore that she is the new CEO because she has certainly been uh, with the airport authority for several years. And uh, uh, she took on and has been leading that organization very strong of course, without knowing that the airlines would be going through one of the largest crises uh, um, in uh, probably modern day history. She can speak probably more to that. Um, so I just want to turn it directly over to her so we're not wasting any of the limited time. Our goal is to keep this within a very tight one hour to respect everyone's time and get everyone on their way. So thank you to everyone who did tune in. It is recorded. We will have that available thereafter. Thank you to all of our speakers. And Danette, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Amber. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me to join you today. It was it was early in the year that I was invited to speak at a TMC breakfast. And some of you may have been there. At this breakfast, I was talking about the great, bright future that we had. Um, we were looking at goals of serving about 4 million passengers, really climbing out of that 2007, 2008 slump, really clawing our way back out. And then um, our focus was to expand the nonstop routes that the airlines serve from Tucson International Airport to include domestic and international markets. Then, as we all know, COVID entered our world and turned everything upside down. Sorry, there might be some aircraft noise in the background. They're a little noisy. Um, my remarks now are gonna focus on the phrase of adapt and strategize for the future. We don't know what's going to happen. Everything is an uncertain. But what is certain is how fast we pivoted to the new reality with a new focus to stabilize and recover. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the COVID-19 impacts and the status um, of, of the aviation industry. First, um, the airline impacts. They're just incredible. 50% of the airline aircraft fleet is, is still grounded. Some of the aircraft will probably never fly again. They, they'll be permanently retired. Some are parked here in our region up at Pinal Air Park. Some of them are right across the field from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, we're hearing airlines are downsizing their fleets, they're restructuring their route systems, the route served and the frequency of service. Um, personnel are being reduced. 
um, through eligible retirements, early retirement packages, or reductions. Today is kind of a pivotal day because today is uh, when the CARES Act funding and the restrictions on the airlines to lay off people end. So you might start seeing in the news some of the big carriers, American, United, Delta, they might start laying some people off. Now, behind the scenes, they've been working with legislators to try to find a resolution. You know, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, CARES 2.0. Um, whether or not that comes to be, I don't know, but um, it, it's kind of a tough time for airlines. It'll be a tough time politically if a lot of people are laid off. So I'm going to remain optimistic and, and hopefully our legislators will find a way to stop the layoffs. Um, part of the CARES Act funding um, included $50 billion for the airlines. And, and obviously that's what they've been using to operate and clearly not enough if, if we're getting to this point and now they're talking about laying people off. Um, again, they're talking to the legislators about another 25 billion in payroll protection. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. It might be a day by day thing. It could be one of those midnight deals. Um, but, but some airlines are not gonna survive. Certainly some of the smaller ones, um, like what happened in the 90s and again in the 2000s, airlines tend to um, gobble each other up. They buy the underperforming airlines for their equipment and for their staff, and then they merge. So we might see a few things happening in, on, on that regard. Um, others will just fold their tents because they were really probably on the edge to begin with. Usually these are the smaller airlines, the, the ones that are the feeder airlines. Now on the airport side of the equation, um, airline service has, has decreased dramatically. The nationwide passenger levels dropped by 96% in early April. And then world, worldwide, there was something like 16,000 uh, canceled reservations and then they stopped booking flights. Now, some flights have partially rebounded to about 30% nationally, um, whereas here at Tucson, we're at about 40% of normal. So we're gonna knock on wood that our, our good weather and open spaces still attract some um, leisure travelers. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Tucson. Um, at our worst, we were down about 96%, and we had 400 people fly out of the airport one day. This is a pretty big facility to manage for 400 people. So we were a little nervous, um, but things are looking up. Our November schedule is showing uh, 30 uh, daily flights. So typically we have 60 to 70 flights. So we're, we're ranging still around that 40 to 42%, depending on, on the day of the week. We um, obviously like all businesses need revenue and we rely on our passenger traffic, not just because they're flying in and out of Tucson, but when they come through the airport, they are buying Coke and a, a magazine and they're parking. So all of that revenue goes into the equation of supporting the operation. So we're losing about 1.5 to $2 million a month. And, but the good news on, on that is that we, we are eligible and can receive up to $22.6 million of CARES Act funding for the eligible expenses to manage our revenue shortfall and pay for the things that are operationally necessary to keep us going. Um, I probably don't have to tell you that we operate in a highly regulated environment. The FAA and the TSA regulations offer us no exceptions. Um, all commercial service airports have to operate and manage their facilities to the same standards that existed pre-COVID to maintain their operating certificate. We're no different. In fact, we have a certification inspection by the FAA in a few weeks and followed by a, a test of our TSA explosive detection K-19, the bomb dogs, a few weeks later. Um, what's interesting about the bomb dog team is that our three K-9 teams also serve on the Pima bomb squad and are called out for a variety of regional bomb threat issues. And so they're a community and a regional asset, not, not just only an airport asset. So what does the recovery look like? Um, well, for us, 
Uh, I told you we had $22.6 million that we're eligible for. We've done the math and, and looked at a financial spending plan over the next couple of years, which, which we believe will be a little bit on the rough side. So we can spread that money across um, to, to cover our shortfalls. Um, one of the things we did, uh, we have to negotiate every year with the airlines um, our budget. And because at the end of the day, the airlines pay for what we do here. Um, if we come up with a $30 million budget, it, it, it boils down into the rates and charges the airlines pay through landing fees and rents and, and other fees. This year, we offered the airlines a one-time 25% reduction in their fixed rent, and our strategy was twofold. We wanted to use the CARES Act funds to assist the airlines. And it was also, you know, a little bit selfish too, because we want them to be here. We don't want them to cut flights. We want to keep our costs low to retain the airlines, their service, uh, to regain their footing. And then hopefully when they feel comfortable, they'll add additional service. Um, for us, the strategy had an immediate benefit. When we first saw the publications of the flight schedule for November, it had 23 flights on it. Immediately after we did the 25% reduction, the airlines boosted it to 30 flights a day. So if that's not a correlation, I don't know what is. So um, we felt that strategy was successful. The airlines have been really, really grateful about it because they need all the help they can get. On the customer side of the equation, um, we really have to work on, on customer confidence, making sure that people feel comfortable and safe flying um, and using our airport. So we started a TUS CARES campaign, and the campaign focuses on ways to restore customer service and customer confidence uh, that's safe to use the airport. We have spent almost $300,000 on a variety of things, um, but the high level things are the UV lights on the handrails, um, they sanitize the escalator and uh, moving walkway handrails. We now have toe kick buttons on elevators, which I like because if your hands are full, it's nice to be able to use your feet. But for those people who don't want to touch anything, you can just press the button in the elevator or call the elevator with your feet and, and then get in the elevator and press a one, two or three, depending on what floor you're going to. We have acrylic shields uh, mounted at all the transaction counters throughout the uh, terminal and um, complex, you know, including the rental cars. We've got social distancing dots and signs on the floors and on the seats. We've got the mask requirement. Um, we also have our custodial team carrying around these backpacks that, that are these atomizer cleaning um, equipment so that they, it really can sanitize an area very quickly, a really large area. So we're doing that frequently throughout the uh, terminal. Uh, and just um, yesterday, we found out that we are the first airport in Arizona, I know for a fact, and maybe the first of a handful that have been certified by the Global Biorisk Advisory Council. And it's a pretty big deal. Um, you really have to show what you're doing as far as your, your standards, your protocols, your procedures. Um, and it, the, um, it's an accreditation. The process that we applied for, it took us several months, but we knew we could do it. And we just got word yesterday that we are now a, a GBAC accredited facility. So you'll probably see a press release on that. So um, we knew we were clean before, but now we've been accredited as being clean. <laughs> yeah. um, also part of our TUS CARES campaign is our messaging. Um, we're doing a lot of radio announcements. Um, you'll see things on billboards. It, it, it's they, we're really focusing on when people are comfortable and ready to fly, you know, we're here for you. There's a lot of social media um, about what we're doing at the airport, you know, what the passenger and the touchless journey will be as you're coming through. We've got print ads. And then we're, we're coordinating with other stakeholders um, like Visit Tucson. You probably start to see uh, an ad come out uh, that, to, that Visit Tucson and, and the TAA worked on together on attracting people to this region. Um, I think it'll probably be hitting, you know, the, the public in about a week or two. Um, also, during this um, period, the TAA adopted a three-year strategic plan, and it really focuses on adapting, adapting to the changing circumstances and, and recovery. 
And what we're, what we're feeling is that if we can capitalize on, on different opportunities and adjust ourselves to the new reality, um, we can be better prepared going into the years 21, 22, and 23. Uh, what's really important for us and for our community is that we continue to be a self-sustaining uh, organization and deliver the operational success for the benefit of the region. And uh, that's, that's one of our top priorities. Um, I've shared a lot of information with you so far, and, and I probably uh, spoke way too fast, but there's, there's one thing I wanna really leave you with is that um, it's gonna take us some, some time to recover. It could be years. Um, this means getting our flights back and adding flights. We're not gonna stop trying. We, we know the destinations that people are interested in and in seeing. Um, right now we wanna regain service. Um, if we can add new service, that'd be fantastic. Um, but right now it's, it's all about get what we've lost. Um, the story though that we like to say is that we've got a good, great low cost airport and a low cost story to tell. And we've got a really good plan and the passion to make it happen. The airlines are really happy with us. We have a great relationship. And um, there isn't a week that goes by that I'm not talking with corporate for the airlines about air service or costs or what we can do to help. So it's been a really good partnership. Um, sometimes it's not always like that, um, but it is like that right now. And I hope that we can keep this going into the, the recovery. Um, my ask for this group and anybody that is traveling is that you support this airport. When you're ready to fly again, choose to fly to and from Tucson. Because when you choose to go north to Phoenix or Mesa Gateway, you are taking flights away from Tucson. This is a time where we really need every single person that has to fly. We need their body in the seat so that it can be counted. So the airlines know that we do have the market to support air service. Um, it's kind of one of those wicked things that in order to get service, you have to prove that you need service. And if everybody's driving to Phoenix for other flights, the airlines see that and say, well, if they're already going here, why should I go there? So it really makes it difficult for us to get these flights everybody wants if, we're, if we don't show that we've got the ridership. So that's my message today. Um, I, I know I've left you with a lot and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, there are a few questions I was watching in the chat mm -hmm. here, Danette. Um, what was the employment at TIA prior to COVID and what is it now? Um, that was a question from Grant wanting to know some real numbers there. Real numbers. Uh, TIA, um, the organization, we have 251 um, full-time employees and about 17 part-time employees. Um, we have put a number of positions on hold. I think we've got about 10 or 15 positions on hold. And um, some of them we've released because um, you know, we might, we need them. Um, but uh, the board, uh, my board was, was very supportive when we came to them and even the airlines and saying that we didn't cut our staff back. Um, but what we did say was we will monitor that budget closely to make sure that our revenues and our expenses, even with using CARES Act funds, um, will, will be, remain level. So we have to be really careful about that because it's really easy to get upside down. Uh, our, our goal at this point is you know, to keep the staff that we have, um, but if we have to make different choices along the way, we, we, we have to make different choices. So Barbie asks, how can the business community best support TUS? I know you touched on a few things that are very important in terms of taking service when we can, uh, every chance we can from Tucson. What else can we be doing to help? Well, you guys are, are wonderful um, advocates in the community. You know a great many people, you're all connected business leaders. And um, if people are, are saying that our airport's too small or we don't have enough service, um, you know what, they might be right. We are smaller than Phoenix and we don't have the same level of service. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't get to where you're going from Tucson. Um, you know, we serve something like 345 destinations or we did before COVID and not all nonstop, of course, but um, you can get anywhere from our airport. So we really have that going in our favor. 
Um, some people really just want to have that nonstop flight. And, you know, I, I don't know what to say to that other than support local. Um, and, and that's just a choice that people have to make. So um, give us a shot. Give us a chance. Great. So James asks, what's the forecast on travel for the upcoming holiday season? What do you think is going to happen? What are some trends we might see? Well, if the COVID numbers continue to decrease, um, I think you might see people feeling a little more comfortable. I think people have been cooped up quite a, quite a long time and they're ready to start moving and visiting family. And I think it depends on the state that you would be traveling to. Um, what I do, you know, we've got an air service conference in Denver next, uh, next month. And what we're looking at is where are we going and what is the safety risk of that city? So you want to look at that to see what the COVID numbers look like there. If you're staying with friends and family, great. But if you're going to a hotel or you're at a convention, just have to weigh those, uh, those um, risks. Uh, but I think a lot of people are just so tired of, of just being at home that they want to get out. So it won't be a booming travel season like it has been in the past because we don't have the flights. But I think, I think we're going to see a lot of traffic. So there was a follow-up question to, I think you had mentioned um, the planning efforts, the three-year plan. Um, how will that address regrowth strategies based on the impacts of COVID-19? Uh, what will that three-year plan speak to? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, obviously, we, you know, our, our primary um, responsibility is to operate the airport system um, because without compliance with the with the rules and regulations it's kind of hard to make money when you've lost your certification um, so that's the top priority for us but it's to regain revenue and airline revenue and and passenger revenue is not our only revenue stream you know we we always talk about diversification so we also want to look on on kind of one of our other little our business initiatives it's on the economic development side of the equation uh, what can we do to be better prepared to attract um, new businesses either to the region or to the airport? Or do we have people that uh, simply want to expand? Um, what, kind of cap what kind of abilities um, or facilities might we be able to offer? That kind of thing. Um, you know, we've, we've got a lot going on here from a construction standpoint uh, that limits our ability to do everything um, that we would like to do. Uh, for instance, um, we are doing a groundbreaking in about, I think it's about two weeks now. We are, are um, groundbreaking for our airfield safety enhancement project. It's a really long planning project. It's been about 10 years in the making. And um, this is the, the project you may have heard about where we're making airfield changes. We're going to demolish um, our uh, one of our parallel runways, which is very undersized. It's narrow and short and we're gonna relocate it and make it true, truly parallel to its other runway. A lot of people have, have thought this is the Air, Air National Guard's runway. They are going to use that runway um, and, and that's wonderful because that'll give us some uh, duplication with having true operating uh, parallel runways. The downside of that is that's $300 million. <laughs> so anybody ha wanna have a bake sale with us? Um, most of it will be federally funded, but the, our local matching share could be anywhere from 10% to 30%, depending on the uh, grant factors during that year. We do have some contributors. ADOT will be part of that. And um, Air National Guard, the military, is also a contributor with grant funds. So it's not just us by ourselves. Um, but but I, I tell you about this $300 million because that's an obligation that we have. We've got, we've got this authorized through the FAA. Actually, they're pushing it because it's a safety project and the airlines. And so we've got some uh, encumbered funds going in that direction. So we have to look at what, what funds are available to really invest in economic development and ready facilities so that we can attract um, new businesses. Um, so that's one way to look at new revenue streams. So we're looking at um, putting together a commercial and industrial plan that really helps us to prioritize what we're doing and when we're going to do it. Um, you may know that we have a relationship with Sun Corridor. Um, we have a contract with them and they are immensely helpful to us. 
So we'll be partnering with them on the plan because they're in the best position with their network and their outreach into the world um, to help us to better define what we should do and when we should do it. So again, we don't want to miss out on opportunities, but we don't have, we're not just sitting on a treasure trove. So we'll have to, you know, be very strategic in what we do. Right. And that answers a couple questions that were <laughs> coming up in the chat room. And so that's super. And, and that marketing piece speaks to even Grant's follow up about that. You know, how do we, how do we tell people we have a safe place, a safe environment and, and encourage them to visit? And, and I think all of us have, you know, the county, the city, uh, all of our partners have been working hard to make sure that that messaging is out there and that we can help restore consumer confidence and traveler confidence in that manner. So, um, and that's great. So uh, Amber, I'll, I'll kick it back to you for a moment and then we'll uh, get ready for our, our part two. I wanna thank Danette as well, um, Amber. I wanted to give a little bit of history of this partnership as related to uh, National Manufacturing Day. Barbara and I got together last year and we were talking about how manufacturing is a significant industry in Tucson, which so many people don't even realize. We have a very robust, I believe it's the fourth or fifth largest aerospace and defense industry hub across the country. And it's important for us to be able to support that industry as well as all of our manufacturers. In general, the manufacturing industry has such a diverse type of uh, employment opportunities that it really speaks to our community. The so last year we brought together Pima Community College that is training up some of our uh, future manufacturer employees, as well as the Boys and Girls, well, not was it, yeah, Boys and Girls Club and Arizona Commerce Authority, because we wanted those youth to understand what those opportunities are, and they were able to tour some of our manufacturing facilities as well to get that level of excitement as part of a career exploration. Um, so this is our second annual celebration of that industry with all of those goals in mind, which is to support our local manufacturers so that they can continue to grow and thrive as such a large component of our uh, local economy. Uh, so with that, I'll have Barbara introduce to our three panelists today. Great. Thanks, Amber. So this is, uh, this is exciting opportunity on the day before National Manufacturing Day. It's technically tomorrow. It's always the first Friday in October. Um, and Amber gave us a, a great sort of um, intro into how and why we, we like to promote and spotlight our local manufacturing industry. So who better to do that than three greats from our community? Uh, I'll have on our panel today, Grant Anderson, President and CEO of Paragon Space Development Corporation, Juan Cardenas, Vice President at Cade Automation, and Howard Stewart, President and CEO at AGM Container Controls. So I welcome the three of you and appreciate the time uh, that you're taking with us this morning. Uh, and we're going to jump right into it. And I thought uh, really, it would be great to hear uh, an update from each one of you. If each of you could take a couple of minutes and share how things are going for you in your industry sector. How is your business faring in terms of pre-COVID-19 to today? Uh, so with that, I'll kick it to Howard to, to get us rolling. Uh, Howard, if you'll take it first. Welcome. And unmute. Oh. Unmute yourself again. One more time. There you go. Can you all hear me? Gotcha. I just like to echo kind of uh, one thing that Danette uh, said a moment ago about the uh, Tucson International Airport. It's really important that all of us just be fully supporting it. I've really come to the conclusion that if, that any great city in this country has a great airport, and the only way we're going to get there is if all of us support this airport. And I myself, I never fly out of Phoenix and I try to make sure that my employees don't eat either. So um, moving on, uh, we're doing, we're doing a, um, probably a lot better than most. So we're, we're actually part of the nation's critical infrastructure. That's how we're, we're designated as such. Uh, ever since COVID began, we've not been able to, you know, have any days off and our employees have uh, experienced full employment during this period. Um, we're, we are down on shipments this year compared to 
uh, the previous year, but we're probably about even, uh, maybe a little behind 2018. So um, not, not overly, you know, not overly concerned. And it seems like we're right now beginning to experience an uptick. Uh, we're very fortunate to be on a lot of the sort of critical infrastructure equipment systems in the country. And that's, that's making things better for us. Um, you know, what we've been able to, I mean, we've put a lot of time into trying to make sure that our employees are safe uh, from COVID-19. I got probably a dozen different uh, practices that we implemented here. And uh, so far, I'm pleased to report that we haven't um, had a confirmed case of COVID-19 amongst any of our 130 or so employees. And that despite the fact that uh, a number of employees have reported COVID-19 cases in their own families, in other words, people living in their own homes. Um, but I actually kind of think that um, the COVID-19 stuff that we've implemented has not only helped the employees stay safe at work, but I think that they have just sort of automatically um, taken those safety procedures and implemented them and their own in their own family life. That's great. No, I, I appreciate that. And that's a testament to all the work that everyone had to do rather quickly to adjust to sort of those new realities uh, in the workplace. Juan, why don't you share a little bit about what you're seeing uh, and what has happened in the world uh, of CADE automation? Um, great to meet you, everyone. Uh, so CADE has uh, three different groups, and I uh, I am in the automation and robotics group. So when, uh, when they sent us home uh, back in March, um, I didn't know how the market was going to react. So I, uh, I called my team uh, and I say, guys, we need, to, uh, we need to focus right now on trying to, uh, to, to contact customers, uh, you know, try to bring some business to, uh, to, to the company. Uh, so I try to instill in them, uh, you know, some positivism. Um, so what happened is that uh, uh, when we started actually calling customers because everybody was at home, they were actually responding, right? Uh, uh, so we saw that uh, this was an opportunity to actually get in communication with customers that sometimes was hard to, uh, to get a hold of. Um, and immediately, because we we are involved in uh, designing and building equipment for the medical device industry, uh, we started seeing that a lot of our customers uh, were actually in panic to get the equipment quickly because they were uh, providing either equipment for ventilators or for masks or for testing for COVID. Uh, so it was a fire drill. Um, just to give you an idea, on the second week that I was home, I had 21 WebEx sessions, and the next one was 23. Um, so I've been working myself no more than, or no, no less than 10 hours since, since March, right? It's, uh, it's just unbelievable. Um, all the other segments are obviously slow. Uh, but we've been fortunate, at least on this division, that, uh, that we are in the right market at the right time. So um, we were considered essential. Uh, everybody's uh, employed here, working long hours, uh, under a lot of stress. But the stress is, is, the, is the good stress because uh, uh, it's the stress where you have a lot of work, not the stress where nothing is coming down the door. So that's where we are right now. No, thank you, Juan. I, I think it was interesting for us as we saw so many of our small service and retail oriented and hospitality businesses um, hit so hard. We were, we were really hoping that that manufacturing sector would sustain us. And, and it sounds like that we're seeing that. Um, I'll be interested. Let's hear from Grant. If you'll share a little bit, Grant, uh, in, a, in a different industry sector, um, maybe you can share how it's been for you. Yeah, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Grant Anderson, the President and CEO of Paragon Space Development Corporation. Uh, we definitely have been a bright spot, uh, a little bit like um, like like Howard and, and maybe Juan too, is uh, we've actually tripled in size since COVID started. 
And um, that has nothing to do with COVID. In other words, we're not doing anything related to ventilators or everything. It just happened to be that the moon initiatives are all hitting at the same time. And we do, for those of you who don't know, life support and extreme environments, which means about 80, 70 to 80% of our business is spacecraft. Um, we have won some nationally recognized programs like the human uh, lander system. Uh, and there's some that we've won way I'm still not allowed to talk about. Um, like Howard, we have what's called a D-Pass rating, a Defense Product uh, Production Act rating, which means we got a letter from the Department of Defense saying you may not shut down. Um, and so that's been a fun thing to do is to balance that with the, um, with the different locations. We have three locations in the United States. Our headquarters, the majority of our people are here, but we're also in Houston and Denver. And I've had to be able to track what the what the Dem all the governors want all what the counties want all what the cities want and trying to distill that down into a common policy among the companies uh, for keeping our employees safe i think we've done a pretty good job i just looked it up and i've spent 52 hours on nothing but covid since it started in march uh, may not sound like a lot but that's a little week and a half out of my time actually for what i work that's about two-thirds of a week out of my time but um but it definitely has had a hidden impact just on on concentration, especially in a high growth uh, environment like we are. Um, as far as how we've worked with COVID, um, about uh, 80 to 90 percent of our of our employees in the two Houston and the Denver locations have been working from home because we don't manufacture there. But here, of course, we do all of our manufacturing in Tucson. Uh, it's very hard to take a five ton, $1 million machine home for the weekend to work from home. So obviously the machinists have to come in uh, luckily. And I think Howard sees this too and, and go on also that these big machines are, are the greatest social distancing tools you ever had. <laughs> it's really hard to get close to each other in, a, in an environment like we were. Um, having said that, uh, you know, what, what we had a big push a lot of employees were like saying, we really want to do something for COVID. We want to be able to do, you know, the uh, helping build ventilators, helping do other things. Um, that was a really tough call. But in the expansion environment, we said, you know, on your own time, you can do whatever you want, but we can't really defocus what we're doing given the, uh, given the, the expansion. It was very heartening to see the amount of care, though, that our employees had for the communities they live in. Um, what I did is I said, what the best thing we can do is make sure that we're doing our well, our, our job well, paying you, and go out and spend your money. Go to go get takeout from local restaurants. Don't you know? Try try to try to make sure you're supporting the local community with the money that we're bringing in, and that's probably the best impact we can do. And uh, I think my employees have been taking that to heart. But that was a lot about manufacturing, but a little bit more of the gestalt. No, oh, that's fantastic. It's great to hear really what goes on inside your worlds and and so much of this, uh, the you know, COVID-19 and this pandemic has impacted us personally and professionally and 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 it all um, it all impacts uh, our business. So if you had to say and I'll ask all three of you and we'll um, uh, we'll change up the order a bit. Um, what has you most concerned right now related to the growth and sustainability of your business. Um, what has you most concerned? And then maybe talk a little bit about some trends that you see going forward. So Juan, would you start? Um, obviously, uh, you wanna diversify always, right? You, you don't wanna have all your eggs in one basket. So uh, right now we're doing well at the automation side because we are involved in medical, uh, but everything else is pretty slow, right? So. So that's one concern that, uh, you know, if, if all your income is coming from only one industry, you are at risk that when, you know, if eventually they find a vaccine or, or you know, the, the virus goes away, you know, maybe that, that uh, medical industry will just go back to normal and all of a sudden you are exposed, right? So that's, that's one concern. Um, going forward, it's hard to... It's hard to say. Uh, one thing that we've been seeing is that uh, uh, our customers are reluctant to travel to see us by air, right? So we have customers in California, and they they all been driving. Um, so that's a concern, you know, for for what we discussed, we were discussing early uh, here, right? Uh, 
everyone thinks differently, right? I uh, I have had the opportunity to, to I, I had to consume vacations, otherwise I'm going to lose them, right? So um, my wife wanted to go to Cancun and things like that, and 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 I'm not I'm not concerned at all about the virus. I mean that's just my personality, right? But but what uh, turns me off about uh, traveling on a plane is having to wear the mask for such a long time, right? That's I, I, and I have talked to a lot of our customers, and, and they feel the same way. So there's nothing you can do, right? But uh, obviously, it's, it's a concern that I think I think that the industry is going to change. Uh, there's going to be a lot more business done remotely instead of pers- you know, face-to-face. And I think that that's going to impact, actually, the travel industry. Mm-hmm. That's how I see it. And that makes sense, especially when you're talking about those, the customer interactions, the sales interactions, they probably are uh, more, con- more inclined to go virtual because of the inconveniences or, uh, that, are, that exist right now. Um, but I think um, you know, we're learning how to do it. Um, so Grant, why don't you share a little bit from your perspective, what keeps you up at night, then what do you see going forward? Okay, well, definitely in the environment we're in now, what keeps me up is attracting talent. Um, you know, we, we set a goal of hitting a pace of hiring 20 people a month. Uh, we hit that goal for the first few months, and then we saw a drop off. Um, and part of that is a little bit of you, you shake the tree and the, and, the, and the loose fruit drops first. But we're also seeing um, a sort of a retrenchment. Everybody's kind of waiting to see what happens. And that's, that is really due to th- two things, both COVID and the election coming up. Um, unfortunately, it is, a, it is a sport in the United States to cancel the last president's uh, space program uh, just out of spite, maybe even. And, and so there's a lot of worry about that. So trying to attract somebody to, say, upend their life in, in Wisconsin and move to Tucson um, has been tough. Uh, and and uh, we've been pretty good about it, but we've definitely seen some effects and having to give incentives to move here uh, versus staying where they are. And having said that, I will say the, um, the, the other thing that keeps me up tonight is the whole work from home concept, because um, we have a very strong culture here at Paragon. We have actually an award-winning culture. And when you have such a fragmented community, um, just doing nothing but seeing each other on video, it's hard to instill that sort of, well, for I have an open door policy. Well, what's an open door policy when you have Zoom? You know, that means I'll accept a Zoom call from you if you want. But it's really hard to have that, that um, you know, happenstance social interaction that really does help cement the glue of a, of a culture together. Um, and I, you may have seen that I put on the, the chat that I've started traveling again this uh, last month in September for the first time since February. And the reason was I had to travel to my Denver and my Houston locations, frankly, to meet the new employees and, and give them the idea. But yeah, really, I do. I am who I am. And, I, and who you see on video is really who I am. Um, and, and, and to some degree, it's been interesting because so many people are working from home that by me traveling to these places, you know, people do want to come in and see the president and CEO of the company and they kind of don't want to miss the chance while I'm in town. So that was interesting having to come up with a protocol of how to do that. What I ended up doing was three days in each place and having dinner three nights in a row and limiting the group to eight people and doing a lot of, you know, common sense things. Um, and then, of course, making sure uh, both for practical reasons and for liability reasons that it was not mandatory so that I wasn't imposing any risk uh, that people felt were above their own risk tolerance. Um, that was the other issue. But yeah, definitely a culture and hiring, hiring good talent. It's uh, especially in a very specific industry like I'm in, it's hard, hard to do. Um, so right. we're going to touch yeah. on that too again. Um, so let's hear from Howard. What are those things that you're concerned about and what do you see going forward? Well, um, not unlike Grant, I'd say one of my top concerns is just that we continue to stay safe from COVID. Um, obviously, I care about that for the health of the employees, but also from a, a legal standpoint. Um, as of, I think I, I read a month or so ago that over 4,000 cases, um, litigation cases have been filed by uh, lawyers against employers um, in regards to COVID-19 safety practices, where the given companies not being 
safe enough. And um, I'm trying to do everything I can to make sure that we don't expose ourselves to that. And yet, kind of like also, people are sort of getting ready to take a little bit more risk, it seems like. And um, I don't know, it's just a hard, it's a hard one to, to follow. Uh, so the other thing that I'm, that I particularly am concerned about is we acquired a company last year in the um, durable coating equipment area. And um, it struggled, it has it is very much struggled to make sales um, since COVID-19 hit and just trying to understand what's keeping us from being effective in that area. Um, right now, one of the things that I'm trying to do really is to identify like what aspects of this company are, are viable and who do I need to keep on board to make that happen? Because unfortunately, you know, just the ongoing expenses, um, while they're, they haven't been overwhelming to AGM, they're so significant that there's just no question that I'll have to make some cuts. Yeah, tough choices, and and uh, I don't envy that. But I think part of it speaks to this issue, and, and I will turn to this with one of our last sort of key questions about workforce, and and the challenges with maybe uh, finding and recruiting talent. So maybe each of you can speak to that, um, and you know. What are the challenges you see with finding talent and recruiting them? And then what are some things that as a community, uh, we could do better to support you in that? Uh, Grant, do you wanna start this round? Yeah, sure. And, and I, I will say that the, the number one issue we have with recruiting people to Tucson and is um, if you're outside of Tucson and you have kids and you say, Tucson, you type in Tucson schools in, the, in Google, you get a real, um, let's say not a very good picture. There's, there's a lot of negative, both, both deserved and undeserved negative press associated with the school systems in, in Tucson. And for trying to attract talent in the middle of their careers where they have two or three kids at the ages of anywhere from four to 15, um, it, it's hard to, I have to talk to them uh, individually because I, I, I was on the board of a school, of a private school for uh, eight years. So I know the education environment pretty well. And uh, so getting the good stories out, the, the, the stories, uh, what, what I generally tell them is there's diamonds in the rough. There are some definite school uh, issues. Um, so uh, really look hard at who you're voting for, the Tucson Unified School District, look at what they're doing, make sure that they're concentrating on solid education and 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 um, and solid talent uh, because that's that is my hardest thing to get over um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if everybody saw the paper today but we broke the records again for heat in September like we did in July and August that's not helping very much however um, as we all kind of know when we get people here it's really not so bad because it's a dry heat as they say um, but uh, um, but uh, I, I do often tout the fact that I bicycle year round and put in thousands of miles on a bicycle too. So, so the, the recreation and stuff is a good, it's a good story. Uh, the education um, uh, system, like I say, both perceived and, uh, and real issues are, um, are a problem for us. Howard, how can you add to that? What are the challenges you see with, uh, with hiring and retaining employees? Well, um, I wish I had grants problems of my company were tripling in size. I, I wish that were the case. Um, frankly, I have not had to do anything on the recruiting side for um, really any of this year. Uh, I mean, we've had, we've had to fill a few positions here and there, but uh, nothing like what he's going through. On the retention side, um, you know, I think that our company is blessed for one thing. We have a employee stock ownership plan, a plan where all of our, you know, employees become owners. I think that really helps with retention. Uh, we also have a, a, a defined benefit pension plan, which is um, frankly, in my mind, much better than having a 401k. And that helps too. Um, the other thing that it really has been helping us with uh, workforce development and retention is um, our college tuition reimbursement plan. So we have, um, 
in 2018 and 2019, 26% of our workforce was in college. Uh, we expect it to jet up to at least a third of the workforce in 2020. And that really has to do with a lot of um, um, collaboration between ourselves and Pima Community College in particular, of those employees who are attending college, about 70% are going to Pima. Um, but we do actually have people working also towards um, bachelor's and master's and even a doctorate or two. So um, that, you know, when, you're, when, you're, when you do the, t the, the, all of us business owners have this ability to, um, to get um, reimbursed by the government by sending our employees to, to school. A few of us do it. I don't understand why, um, but that I think has really been also a great, a, a great part of why AGM continues to be uh, relatively successful. All right, fantastic. We appreciate that, and I know your employees do as well. Uh, Juan, what would you say when you when it comes to workforce? Do you find what you need and when you need it? Um, how is the situation for you? I think that uh, Grant was probably reading my uh, answer here with respect to schools, because <laughs> yeah, we we had the same problem, right? Uh, the the, the uh, people from outside see the school system here as one of the worst in the nation. Uh, but this has been going on for many years and it is frustrating that nobody does anything about it, right? But um, so what we've been doing, there's, uh, there's several positions that are really hard to fill. One of them is uh, the controls engineer position. So this is the guy that is going to do the programming of the equipment, the robot and do the integration, right? And it is really, really hard to find these people. So what we've been doing is we've been uh, starting to hire engineers from Mexico and just bring them on a visa. Uh, uh, you know, it's a one-year visa that is renewable. Uh, obviously, the risk is that if the government the government makes any change with that, you know, you lose that person, right? Uh, but uh, we have been very uh, very successful with uh, with these uh, people coming from Mexico. Uh, um, I would say that on the retention, we have lost some key people to Raytheon. And, uh, you know, Raytheon is the gorilla. Uh, and, you know, if they, if they need people, they will go very aggressive at trying to recruit. Some people after ending up there, they are not happy because of all the bureaucracy. Uh, but regardless, we have lost people. So uh, we have tried to implement certain programs to make it more attractive here. So for example, uh, the first uh, week of the month, uh, we work from Monday to Thursday, I work 40 hours, and then we have that Friday off. So tomorrow I have off, right? Um, it has helped a little bit, but uh, still it's, it's hard to compete with uh, companies like Raytheon. Those are some great insights and I appreciate that. So with the limited time we have left, what I thought I would do is just sort of a rapid fire for each of you if you can share, what's the next big thing for your company, for your organization? What would be the next big thing? And Howard, why don't you start? Well, I don't know. I mean, I can go back to this acquisition. Um, there are some awesome opportunities. We're, um, we're working with uh, Picatinny Arsenal back in York on getting a mil spec around our coding where we could potentially have our quick coding all the um, M4s and the uh, you know, rifles in the military service. And my coding may be a quarter million um, existing rifles per year plus, plus new ones. Uh, so that's a very exciting opportunity. Um, yeah, that's probably, that's probably the, the, the biggest thing. We're also looking at um, potentially starting a coding center. So one of the problems with the um, Equipment that we manufacture is I think we kind of we don't really always understand what our the marketplace needs because we don't actually have our own uh, uh, coding center to be coding their weapons and then frankly learning learning from those experiences of how we need to change our processes and equipment to to meet the market's needs. So that's another thing that I'm hoping to get off the ground here in 2021. All right. Juan, how about at Cade? What's the next big thing? I would say for Cade Automation will be probably to acquire 
uh, a competitor um, in, in a different part of the country, just to have more capacity and more uh, geographic reach. I think that's what I see our next big thing. Awesome. Well, we like to hear that. That's a sign of growth and stability. So that's good for Tucson. Howard, or did I, I'm sorry, Grant. Grant's going to back clean up on this one. What's the next big thing? Um, well, in the, in the more local sense is that we are moving our headquarters. Um, we own our building here at, uh, down at Palo Verde in, uh, in I-10. However, we've outgrown it. Um, and one of, the, one of the silver linings of the work from home and COVID is that we've we have more employees than we have places to sit right now. Uh, we signed a lease and we're moving and we'll start the moving process uh, in the beginning of November to a new location, which is only a mile away. Um, closer to the airport, by the way, uh, Danette, uh, that's great. So I can have two beers. Uh, if I leave an hour before my flight, I can still get through security and have two beers before I get on the plane, <laughs> instead of just one, just kidding. Um, but no, the other thing, uh, obviously you will see an announcement hopefully soon on this other big program that we've actually been working on since January, but haven't been able to talk about. And then if you also do a Google search for something called Jump for the Planet, uh, you'll see something there that might be of interest. It's just went public a month, a week and a half ago. Uh, and that's another big program uh, uh, that we are working on the initiative. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. And uh, the, the biggest thing is to make sure we keep a work-life balance and, and don't drive ourselves totally nuts. Awesome. Well, I just want to thank all of you uh, for participating today, taking the time out of I, what I've heard you all say, uh, super busy schedules, working 10 and 12 hours a day nonstop. Uh, so appreciate the time that you've taken and also for everyone attending today. Um, and again, if there were any uh, last minute um, questions uh, or comments, I see a couple of things um, that were posted here. Um, so take a look at that. Um, there, there's questions about uh, locations within Tucson, Marana, Grand Valley, and I think some of you have suggested that. Um, what are some of your entry level revolving door positions? And does your organization currently have an internship program? So maybe you can, um, if there is anything uh, that you'd like to share, uh, Howard, Grant, or Juan on any of those items, that would be great. Um, and then, um, and then I think, uh, let's see, we'll, we'll wrap things up. Well, definitely, I, I do wanna say one thing is, is we broke through, there's always been this barrier of, you can't have interns that are younger than 18 uh, because of liability reasons. We, we finally, you know, the, the thing you talk to a lawyer and they'll say, never get a lawyer, get in the way of a good idea. So we talked with our lawyers, came up with a way, and we have interns starting in ninth grade. Um, uh, one, Sam Miguel has been really wonderful with that. Um, so I really do encourage thinking out of the box a little bit and starting internships even younger. Obviously, dangerous ones like in a, in a, in a machine shop were not it, but they're, they're doing administrative duties, but they're learning how businesses work in high school. And we fully see them as employees 10 years down the road after they get out of college. So I encourage that. Great. Thanks for that. So we'll keep everyone on their schedule. It's 10.59 a.m. That gives you a minute back to Zoom to your next meeting. Um, Amber, thanks again for your partnership. Uh, thanks, Danette, uh, for your great presentation and update. I think we're all uh, sensitive to that. And, uh, and we're all anxious to get back on the airplanes pretty soon here. So um, with that, uh, thank you all. And we'll, uh, we'll see you again. Watch your inboxes for more CEO Roundtable events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much, Barbara.